All right. I think we're recording now. Hi. Hi. Hello. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Hamed, a human rights activist. Um, I escaped my country after confronting an imam on air that Islam is not valid. And uh, now I live safely in Germany. Germany, right. Mohammed Hisham, for people that know Mohammed Hisham, his case was very famous. He openly announced his atheism on, li on live TV. Was it live? Live TV, yeah. Live TV in Egypt, and he had paid a huge price for his decision. And he's, he's one of the people that has is responsible for normalizing atheism where it's needed the most, um, more than most people can say. So thank you, Muhammad, for your activism and for your bravery. Uh, I I hope you did you. But by the way, did you, have, did you ever given everything, all the costs and all the BS that you had to go through after you made that decision and having to leave Egypt and having to deal with the, all the processes of the risk, you know, as seeking asylum in Germany. After all of that, do you re regret making? The decision that you did, that you got, that you went live on there, announcing your atheism in Egypt. Um, no, not really. I don't, I don't regret it. Don't regret uh, especially it. that it turned out like better than I expected. Even like I thought I would end up in a prison cell for a long time or something, but I got lucky. This is um, not the situation for other friends, unfortunately. Right. Um, there are people who like got imprisoned or stuck in very terrible and inhuman situation. Right. Uh, but, and before doing that, you, you do it and you know the consequences, you know what might happen and uh, you are ready to endure them, I guess. Right. So, David, before we go on into more detail, we, we are going to be talking about the people that are, are not as lucky as you are. Um, and how we can, that's the whole point of this discussion, is to see how we can help other people basically come to, you know, safety in countries like Germany, Canada, or other countries. We'll discuss that as well. Um, this, you know, but before we go there, David, do you want to introduce, I, I, I don't know if that many people need introduction from you, but just, just let's do it anyways. So, uh, my name is David Silverman. I'm the executive director of Atheist Alliance International, and I'm really, really happy to be here, uh, Armin and Mohammed, uh, because I'm the new incoming di executive director of Atheist Alliance International, and I've got a real bug in my brain to save some lives. And uh, the, I'm really appreciative of you both for um, for creating this little this podcast and Armin, this is a great idea for a series uh, so that we can learn how to uh, make more Muhammads uh, mm -hmm. and, and get them out of Egypt and, and all those places into safety. I want to know all about what happened and I want to know all about how it can be replicated. So, so Muhammad, just to give you some background, uh, me and uh, David have been talking uh, regarding getting Atheist Republic and Atheist Alliance International to start cooperating with each other and finding out a process uh, that coming up with a process that works that is the most efficient way of helping uh, people you know ex-muslims or atheists in trouble that need to be uh, you know help move to a position of safety uh, because so far every time we tried this we failed more than we succeeded and there seemed to be the way that we have been doing it and the way that other organizations have been doing it is figuring it out after something happens, figuring it out as a goal, like just rediscovering the process every time. Um, and, and really, you know, a lot of people have had success, but we don't know why we had success in one cases and why we haven't had success. If we have, if we study enough quick enough of these cases and also try to learn the laws and the people with connections in each uh, each you know each high risk location right then maybe we could come up with a process that we think that would work best but also constantly improving it constantly like trying it looking at the process be t talk to our audience about it 
talk to activists like you, and that's the reason why you're here. Talk to people that have had success, uh, getting their feedback, getting them actively involved in telling us what to do, telling us how to constantly change our process. And also, not just use it ourselves, like coming up with a process that that works. D- David and I were very clear on this as well. We don't. We want to come up with a process that works for us, but also share it with all the other organizations, right? Share it with all, like, be transparent, like, be like, hey, like, this is what's working for us. But every other organization that wants to also be do activism and on on this specifically, they could. They could completely, they could see transparently what we have come up with, and just so they should, they can take it and make it their own, right? Be like, oh wow, Atheist Republic and Atheist uh, Atheist Alliance International have shown that this process works the best, and they could just take it without mentioning us at all and just use it if they wanted. Like we want to be, we just want this to be out there and come up with a. Not not just come up with a process, but also come up with an ever improving process, right? And again, be ta- constantly t- asking our community for feedback, and constantly asking activists like you for feedback, right? So, do, do you what do you think about Mama? Do you think this is a worthy thing to focus on? Well, is this the right direction? Definitely. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's definitely worthy. I think part of it is awareness. Uh, we should raise awareness among activists that they should not risk their lives. That's mm-hmm. how I advise many many of us, uh, as a rule of thumb, try to prioritize your safety. When mm-hmm. you're safe, express yourself. However, of course, there are um, some of us will always decide to give their life to the cause, and they will be ready to endure all the potential consequences to that. Mm-hmm. Some of us got executed by governments, assassinated by terrorists, or just went to prison, or uh, had to cave because of threats and uh, and the fear for their lives and for loved ones. And sometimes there are people who are in a situation where they are not executed or in prison, but they might be. And those people sometimes will ask for our help. And I believe we should do our best to help them. For multiple reasons. First, you would like them to continue their inspiring work. I mean, if they got to be in such dangerous situations, then they are doing something right, you know, and they are forwarding the case and making the world a better place. Right. And we don't really want the government to make an example of them. Mm-hmm. Because usually government or terrorist or whatever, because, because it's just, it negatively affects the cause and defeats our collective spirit. And okay. basically, it's, it's a human thing to help them, you know? It's just you feel sympathy towards someone trying to make the world a better place. That doesn't, it's, it's, it doesn't seem right to me that because someone is trying to make the world a better place, they should go to prison or, or die or, or uh, have to face terrible consequences. It doesn't, it's not fair. So, uh, Mohammed, is 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 the way that we're doing this the right way in your mind? We're going to be going to activists from uh, many countries and asking them on an individual level um, how to help ex-Muslims in that country escape to someplace safe. Is that the most efficient way for the leaders of atheist organizations to fix this problem? Or to learn well, to fix this problem. I mean, currently, as far as I know, many organizations exist that, not many, few organizations exist that try to help uh, getting ex-Muslims or atheists uh, from um, bad circumstances uh, in mostly uh, Islamic majority countries. And they face limitations, uh, financial limitations sometimes, sometimes the limitation with information and connections. And, uh, like, the system is designed that they cannot really do much. I mean, part of it is simply uh, would be considered, um, like, 
for instance, if somebody is trying to escape illegally his country, it's it's just illegally. If somebody inside prison, like what are what are you gonna do really? So it's sometimes very very terrible situations, but there are cases where you could help. There are cases where all what is needed is information. Other cases where all what is needed is some money, and then the person would be able to um, to escape. So okay. I think we should work on making uh, connections, uh, like in each country, each country where we get uh, danger, we should have, we should know people who could help people in case of trouble. We should have, I don't know, like uh, as Armin was saying, we do it on uh, case by case. Like when uh, Sharif had trouble, he had to do a fundraising to have enough money. When when I had trouble, we had to do. There, mu- I think there should be like something more stable than that. Uh, and of course, uh, we also should do our best to lobby for our cause, to gain uh, more dedicated supported supporters to the cause of humanism all over the world, people who would support our cause. Um, we need better lobbying, mostly, I guess. And, yeah. Okay, so, um, here's the thing. So, I think I, right now I come up with tw- every case, every situation. I think there's 10 questions that we need to be asking based on the conversation that we had so far to be able to effectively categorize and, you know, to come up with a good process for every, every single situation. I think there's 10 things that we need to be asking and coming up with good answers for all of this, right? And I think the first one is based on what Muhammad said, is to put out information on two activists, right? Because this is not, this is not going to have that much of a major impact, the first one, but it's a responsible thing to do, just like Muhammad said, is to tell people what the risks are and not to take the risk if they do not wish to. We cannot tell people not to take risk, unfortunately, because some people know the risks, and decide to take the risk, just like Muhammad, right? Right. And we, they're adults, they make decisions themselves. The key thing to do is for us to, if they're taking risks, to to take the risk that they know, right? I don't, we, we need to make sure that people are not doing things and they, they realize that the risk was higher than they anticipated. It's just to put out information about each country, what are the risks that you're taking, um, because activism involves risks, and we just want to make sure that we don't encourage people to take risks, but we also don't make decisions for people. Some people decide that to take risks for the sake of other people, and that's their that's their decision. As long as that is an and informed, there are heroes for it. And what? There are heroes. There are heroes for it. There are they heroes. Yeah. There are heroes. Uh, it's important. Our role is to make sure that they know the risks before they take it. Right. So that's number one. Number two. We need to, you know, there is a, we need to decide who we want to be helping, okay? Because the number of people that need, that there's three, three, there's a funnel. The people that want help, the people that need help, and the people that we can help. And this keeps getting smaller and smaller, okay? The people that want help, a lot of them don't need help, but they want help. A lot of them just want to leave their countries and they're not necessarily at a, at a risk at all, okay? A lot of them just want an upgrade in their lifestyle, right? They, a lot of them are not at risk if they keep their mouth shut, but they want to live in a country where they can speak and that is, that is a worthy thing to want, but we cannot waste our time on you given that there are people that are at risk right now, right? Just the fact that you're an atheist or an ex-Muslim living in an Islamic country, but you're not at risk, but you wish that you could live in a country where you could just say who you are and what you believe in. I understand that that's something that you want, but, you know, if you be quiet, live there and don't let us focus on people that are in great danger right now. And, you know, because we have it. 
if we're if we're helping you just because some, there's something you want, then we, that we don't have unlimited resources. That is coming out at the cost of us focusing on somebody that is, that is in danger right now as we speak. Okay, so we don't want economic migrants. We do want to focus on people that have actual refugee. You know, there will be actual re refugees, not people that pretend to be refugees, but they're actually economic migrants. And I do, I do, I am biased towards actual activists, right? Um, like if we have two cases that are, there's never going to be, two, this is just hypothetical. There are two cases that are equally, uh, that are at equal risk, and we only have time and resources for one of them. One of them was an accidentally is in danger, but one of them is a fellow activist then I do want to focus on the activists, right, rather than somebody that is accidentally was outed. Again, this might sound cruel, but I'm talking about if we have limited resources and we have to pick one, then we, I do think we should focus on the activists. Um, another thing is that we do, n going to number three, is we have to see what is the situation and what is the risk, even if two people have the same Two people are both, you know, let's say two, um, they are at risk. Um, both of them are in danger. Both of them do need help. Again, unfortunately, we don't have unlimited resources. We have to come up with a process where we can evaluate the risks that each one is in and focus on the higher risk individual, right? The person that is in more, the, you know, more immediately in, um, needs more immediate attention, right? Um, then we have to ask, okay, this person, yes, is at high risk, need immediate attention, but can we do anything, <laughs> right? Like Muhammad says, sometimes some person is at a lower risk, but there's something we can do compared to the high risk person that there's nothing we can do, right? So in that situation, we might want to focus on the lower risk person because we have determined that there's something we can do, right? There are some cases that maybe us working on it will bring a person into higher risk. It actually might hurt their case, right? Maybe there are governments that, let's say we focus on somebody, and there's somebody in trouble, and now we're focusing on somebody, and now the government is now paying more attention to that person because we focused on them, right? We're actually hurt the K person's K scenario rather than helping them. So we need to figure out how we can determine that based on the country that we're, and that in, it depends on the country, right? For example, in Iran, if we focus on a case, the government all of a sudden notice something and pay attention to that case, and we don't want to do that. But in Pakistan, it's different. In Pakistan, the government wouldn't um, be as um, as a big of a danger to somebody than a mob, right? then a government might, even the government arresting somebody might actually be a good thing because this person was at uh, risk of being killed by a mob and the government would never kill them and the government arresting a person might actually put them in a position of safety. So again, we have to come up with, we don't know, we have to come up with different answers, different solutions for different countries, right? Um, so that's so, the, so, let's, yeah. so let's talk about Muhammad's specific situation then. Well, let me, let me uh, just... Yeah, let's do that. But let me just tell you what other situations are. Um, I'll tell you really quickly. Then, then when once we decided a case that yes, this is a high risk situation. Yes, we can do something. Yes, we're not going to hurt the situation. Now that's now they have to ask what is it, what it what is it we can do? Do we need money to the, do we need to send the person money? Do we need to give just bring a lot of attention to the case? Do we need to get lawyers for this person? Right. Um, then another question is what country are we talking about? To, are we going to, is the answer is that we need to get them out of there? Where do we need to get them to? Is the answer always Germany and Canada and Australia? Or can the answer sometimes be, you know, Bhutan or some other countries that might be easier to get into? Um, rather, you know, if we just focus on first world countries, maybe we're actually making our process a lot more difficult. Maybe there are other countries that are better, easier to get into and they would, they're lower risk as well. Uh, Again, who do we know? We need to come up. We need to find connections. We need to find lawyers, reporters in each one of these countries. Uh, we need to build a list of connections that we have, and we need to know what are which connections are we going to use for which case. Um, okay, so sorry, David. I just want. I just want <laughs>
Go ahead. What, what did Ali say, Armin, when we were on the podcast together? What did Ali call it when you went on and on and on and talked? You called no, about. I just wanted to give us a framework, though, because we do need to, we do need a frame before we so, do need a framework. So Muhammad. So Muhammad, what I want to know is what was done to help you escape? Well, How did you get out? Yeah, first of all, I had friends around me back then, and they were very wise, and they told me very wise advices. One of which, like, after I, after that show went viral, and I appeared on another show, and I became relatively known in Egypt, and known in the atheist community internationally, um, I... I just basically decided to hide online, not to make any any social media appearances. Like uh, it was very hard to find my my uh, social media contacts, uh, and that in a way reduced the heat. Because usually, when people uh, try start to be active on social media, that increases the danger. Um, and that also helped not not to be active, uh, to escape, uh, to hide on social media, keep a very low profile. Uh, and afterwards, I needed uh, some money to be able to uh, escape the country because my money, uh, in a way, got confiscated by my family. And... Uh, that was basically what was needed, actually. So how did I you did get out? Get you the money. Sorry? How did you get the money? A fundraiser. Uh, Troy, Troy Garno, a friend from Australia, a dear friend from Australia, started uh, fundraising. Uh, it got shared by atheist people, and uh, it got shared by Sam Harris, Armin, many, many great people helped me uh, during that. And afterwards, I just uh, came out with a plan uh, to be able to escape the logistics. Organization, many organizations helped me with invitation to conferences so that I uh, try to go to a safe country with a reason to attend the conference, but uh, this didn't work. Um, yeah, that process doesn't work anymore. Um, it used to work, but now it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, it's on, on every country or just from this country. Uh, most countries, most countries uh, have seen. Most countries have woke up. England. So uh, yeah, those two countries. So it didn't work. So I can tell you um, recent. So the escape methods, um, Mohammed. Right now, you could tell me there. There is. There's. If you know of any other, right? The two methods that I see the most is either to try to cross a border illegally, um, usually on a boat, right? Um, without, ta without talking to any agents, border agents or anything, you're not going through any, uh, you're just getting on a boat or, you know, getting on a, into a, on a donkey or something or going, going under a fence or something. That's one, mostly it's a boat, mostly it's a boat. The second method that I see a lot is fake passport, right? Yeah. Fake passports and or, or just crossing the border without talking to an agent or something. And when it comes, actually not fake passports, real passports of, of lookalike people, okay? I don't know, I, maybe both of them, but what I've seen is lookalike passports of, your, of yourself, right? So the, the problem with both of these is that we, as, as, legal <laughs> organizations like Atheist Republic and Atheist Alliance International, we cannot aid in that, right? Because now we're actually um, promoting illegal activity, okay? So we cannot, we cannot do that, right? Um, but I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking of that issue and like you cannot really promote illegal activity, I know. Yeah, you could. I was thinking if you have connection in this country, like you know people there, and I think it's legal and you are allowed, as far as I understand, to get the activist, 
to help them with money and then maybe your your friend your the the people that the activists are going to be introduced to uh will be able to help them doing that you don't have right. to do any of that yourself that's exactly what i was going to say next i think there's two things that we can do okay two things that AAI and A- Atheist Republic can do uh, is one, get them some cash, right? Basic, very limited cash. And it's not, I, I, a lot of these people have to understand that they're not going to be checking into hotels and shit like that, right? Especially because some of these people come from Saudi Arabia and their lives in Saudi Arabia used to be very, very good. Okay, so they have to understand that um, if you're getting out of Saudi Arabia, you're you're not gonna have the same lifestyle that you used to have before. Okay, so this is just so that you don't starve to death. Okay, that and that you don't have to, especially for women, uh, that you're not sleeping in the streets. Okay, because the women that get out of Saudi Arabia, they get rape threats multiple times before they get to their final destination, right? Like, it's almost expected, right? It's almost expected that you're coming out of Saudi Arabia, you're, like, in Turkey now, like, you're going to Syria, now you're, like, now you're in Greece with somebody. You're, you're going to get rape threats, right? So you have to, like, we have to figure out how we could minimize the risks once you get rape threats. Like, it get you into somewhere, like, you could check in so you're not sleeping in the streets. Like, Ron had to sleep in the streets, right? Um... We need to figure that. We need to have a guide for them. Like, okay, you're, you're like, we have to have a different guide for each person. Like, oh, you escaped Iran and now you're in Turkey. What do you do? Here's how you get a job. They need to get a job. Okay. They need to, we cannot, they cannot just rely on us sending them money all the time because we're going to have limited resources. We need to create guides for them on how to get a job in Turkey, how to get a job in Syria, how to make money when you're in this country, in that country. We need to, so, Our role is to, okay, so actually we have three roles. Getting them some initial funds, just very limited initial funds, creating them a guide, right? And third is putting them in touch with people, right? So we need to have a network. We need to have a network in Turkey. We need to have a network in Germany. We need to have a network in every every, every country. And every, every case that we focus on, Instead of us reinventing the wheel every time, we know the people that will be able to help. We need to get people that are going to commit to our cases, right? So we need to be like, listen, you are our, our contact in Turkey, okay? You are our contact in Turkey. Can you commit? If when we have a case, when we have somebody that is r- running away from, I don't know, what this country or that country, and now they're in Turkey, we're not going to send you more than, I don't know, one case a month. Can you commit to our one case a month, please? Can you promise us that you're going to take care of our person? So, and then we're going to have a list of contacts. What do you guys think about that with regards to? It doesn't sound like enough. Go ahead. Mohammed, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's um, like we already have limited power in this situation and we cannot do much more actually david you you are you don't understand how much this how much more this is than what people are getting right now okay well no and what I, i'm what i'm saying is that uh i think i i understand that there's a lot more here but um i mean it sounds like what you're proposing armin is just to have a network of friends and throw a little money at it. And I was under the impression that we had to deal with visas and asylum and, 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 and all of the, uh, inter inter company, inter country, uh, right. issues that are around that, 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 that it's, that it's more so, than just so finding friends. David, and, asylum, and you, can't, money. you can't, you can't, well, no, okay. No, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm, David, what is it? Tell me, I'm asking. Right, right, right. Mohammed, go ahead. Okay, uh, I mean, I would like to point out that uh, usually, I guess, embassies has the power to help in most situations. Uh, they, could, they could get people out if they want to. Sometimes they have to pay some uh, price, uh, diplomatic uh, issues might arise out of that. And that's, that's the thing guys, with guys, if you, you have to You have to build a scale, a, a, a first basic structure before you build on it okay you have to based on the limited resources that we have 
we will say like this is what we can offer right now and we test it and then we can keep adding to it if you if you try to do what i mean too much from right from the beginning that comes at a cost at the people at the number of people that we can help right and when i when i say so you say you throw money at it oh you were just going to throw money at it david that is the main that is just the main thing that they need at if they are out that is what they need there a lot of the things that has to be done by them okay a lot of the things has to be done by them you cannot just be like hey come somebody come pick me up all right there needs to be an effort from their part to meet us halfway okay look at muhammad's case look at rana's case these are successful cases, okay? The reason why they're successful cases is because they did a lot of the work themselves and they told people exactly where others could come and fill in the gap. Rana did most of the work. She, the only thing she couldn't have done herself was that extra little bit of cash. And when Atheist Republic did a fundraising for her, that extra bit, little bit of cash meant a lot for her. it wasn't that much cash, but that that was that is what made the difference, right? To get her. How much cash are we talking about? Home. I have to look up. I have to go look up the fundraising. I think like it was thousand dollars. Mm, here I could go. Rana Ahmed, GoFundMe. I could check right now. I forgot how well, much. Inspiration, Armin. Huh? So how? The Muhammad, how did you uh, get out? But Muhammad, did you get out legally or illegally, and did you use a real passport or a fake one? I used a, a real one. I got uh, I got out legally, and uh, that's what I was talking about: uh, um, going uh, pretending to be a Muslim and going low profile. That gave me the opportunity to do oh, that. As an we activist, ra we raised six thousand for Rana at Atheist Republic. Okay. So, but but if we knew what we know now, we would have been able to make that money do a lot more. Okay. Um, because we're not going to be able to raise six thousand every time. Okay. We need to be able to say like that. That's the best case scenario for us so far. And it, honestly, I rather. Use six thousand dollars to save six people, you know. Like even they're like, oh, we could raise more. We could raise fifty thousand dollars. Well, don't don't spend fifty thousand dollars on one on one person. If we are more efficient, we could use fifty thousand dollars for fifty people. If we sh if we make a guide to for them, like, okay, you're in Turkey. This is where you go get a job. This is how you get a, you're gonna get a job and make money online. Then that fifty thousand dollars could be enough for fifty people rather than one per line one case, right? Right. Right. Uh, maybe we could come up with online jobs like, oh, this is how you sell gigs on Fiverr, right? While you're while you're running away and make money online, like we'll set up a PayPal account for you, right? Uh, what are your skills? How what can you do when you when you're when you're on the run, right? So and David, when it comes to visa, okay. So the problem with uh, Muhammad, you can correct me on this. The problem is that you cannot get unless you know apply for refugee status or something like that before you land on a you know maybe unless you get into a embassy or something right it's, it's very difficult uh you actually could start opening a case once you're in that country correct yeah uh, it's it's mostly the case you have to be out of your country to be able to apply for any sort of asylum right i've heard i've heard i'm not sure that the french embassy has a program where you could uh, apply for asylum anywhere, but I'm not really sure. Uh, and I've heard that also didn't work for many people. But right. yeah, right. the situation is that you have to be out, even to have uh, UNHCR help, you have to be out of your country. Exactly. So David, there's, the, I think what, the reason why you're saying, oh, we, I thought we are going to help people with visa process and all that, that's a separate thing, right? There's, we oh. have to figure, we have to have, there's two different topics that we're talking about, right? How do we help people get away? Okay. And then the separate category is, how do we help people that are outside get an, get a successful refugee status? 
becomes. I, I understand get, that. Yeah. So, uh, so I, we can, I understand we can that. So. that as well. We can help with that as well, right? Um, and and that's it. But I think the more immediate situation is to get people out when they're when they are at risk of dying or being in prison, right? And getting people out. Unfortunately, you cannot apply for asylum status or something like that when they're still not out. Okay, um, I understand. Right. So, so, so the, the process of helping them with legal processes and getting them visas or getting them and uh, uh, getting into getting them into court system and getting them a refugee status that is that comes after they're already out. I get it. So when you're in the country and you're trying to get out and you're you're, you're trying to get out illegally so so when you're in the country and you're trying to get out legally let's say you're in um so you were in egypt right yeah. Egyptian. Okay. so yeah. Yeah. uh if you wanted to leave what made your exodus legal and would it still be legal today uh well i mean legal uh to be legal really because even even the way i i got out wasn't wasn't 100 legal uh i mean but anyway um what makes it legal is to have a normal i i'm not sure i mean i don't think that there is anything that would actually make it 100 legal because you get a visa for tourism for instance if you manage to do that and you Let us say you got a visa for tourism and you went to the country, destination country, let us say any country that uh, Canada, for instance, and then uh, you're there and you say, oh, sorry, I'm not here for tourism. I'm here just because I'm escaping persecution or some people w were after me and want to kill me or whatever. Mm. That, that, like, that little part wouldn't make it legal. You know, right. well, what, I'm, what I'm actually what I'm what I'm thinking about, what I'm trying to think about, what I'm what I'm worried about is you're in Egypt and you're an ex-Muslim and you want to leave the country. Let's talk about that piece. I, I understand once you're out, you have to do a whole bunch of asylum stuff and, and, and all that stuff. What I'm looking for is at the airport in Egypt, when you want to leave and you're going through customs, um, is there anything stopping you? And yep. is there anything stopping you now? Is, depends is, is, on the case. Okay, really so depends. what would stop a yeah, person who's an expert in Egypt? Things that will stop you. Some people are in a terrible situation where if they went to the airport, they would get arrested there. Right, like, like, Shari if, like Sharif. Like Sharif, Sharif Jabbar, for instance. He, there is a prison sentence of three years on him, so he's escaping literally prison sentence. And, and, other, and the other friends, yeah. Uh, other friends, uh, they have something called the travel ban. So if they went to the airport and tried to leave the country, uh, um, a security officer will take them to an office mm -hmm. and put them and let them stay there until their flight passes and then release them from the airport. That's travel ban. That would uh, that would make it hard for them. And the the, the uh, problem, uh, Mohammed, the problem is that the people that we need to help the most are the people that probably would be stopped at an airport. Yeah, exactly. And you have also uh, other situation, or, or like that is the most situation, let us say the government is not really aware of you, or currently they are not after you. Still, to get a visa to a safe country, that is not easy. Mm. What, is okay. it, what is involved with that? Tell me about that. Well, usually when you are uh, an activist and you're really escaping uh, and you want to like you're escaping for your life you it's usually you don't meet the requirements for for uh, a visa so you are in a in a tough situation and you're not in a your life is not so stable and in order to meet all the requirements let us say for a tourist visa you need a degree of stability in your life so um uh, uh funds being deposited in a certain way in a bank account having uh regular income yeah regular income uh, job whatever and you're talking about people for instance who got uh, kicked off of the job because uh, he's gay or because she's uh, uh, she's an atheist or so the situation is not is not always uh, easy uh, to, to manage to do that the, the, so, the reason but yeah. the reason the reason again so again this is egypt as soon as you move to another country everything now is different if you go now to right. iran 
Now everything yeah. is different. Now we go to Pakistan, everything is different, right? And the reason, the reason, David, I want to f- rely on local networks with each and uh, e- with each one of these countries is exactly for that reason, right? Because not only we, I don't want us to reinvent the wheel. The wheel keeps getting updated every every year for each one of these countries, right? The situation that we have in Iran. Uh, this year is different from what it was last year. And nobody is going to be able to, um, the best people to that know what the situation on the ground is, is the local activists, the local lawyers, um, you know, the people with the knowledge on the ground. So that, that this is, that, this is why this has, has to be done with, key people that we have for each one of these countries. Like we need partners for each one of these countries that we work with on, uh, on an ongoing basis. And for those situations, when we have an active network in a local, in a local situation, when we have a, a, an active local network helping out, the main function that you, Armin, and I are going to do is provide funding. That's the thing that we're giving. When we have this local organization that's providing this this feedback, the main thing that we're doing is providing funding. We're not providing any sort of letters. We're not providing any sort of housing. We're not providing any sort of um, job or anything like that. The thing that we're doing to get people out, I understand that once they're out, they have to you know uh, apply for refugee status. I get that. But what we are doing, Armin, mm. is providing organization or connecting somebody to an existing network and providing funding right. probably to that network so that we can trust that it's going to be used well. And then um, hoping that that network gets that person out of the country, either legally or illegally. Yeah, and not that you, you have to create the network also, because as far as I know, there is not much there. Right. So... So, so there's, that, there's that's very important. So there's three things we're going to be doing. Funding is number one, gu- a, a guidance number two, right? Jobs, risks, um, places to stay, safe, safe hubs, safe hubs. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If we could, if we could come up with safe hubs, like in in every country, safe hubs. Uh, the third one is connection. So build a network, and as soon as the case. So funding, guidance, and connection. Funding, guidance, and connection. And this is this is we could start with. As we keep going by, we might come up with number four, number five, number six. But I think that based on what David just said and based on what Mohammed said, I think these are the three things that we could focus on: funding, guidance, and the connection and connections. And we would do that in all the countries. That would be ubiquitous in all the countries. The the the, the local organizations will be different and the procedures will be different but the actual functions that AR and AAI would be doing would be the same in all of the countries right okay yeah that's good that's good that would make it yeah that's a good way to look at it yeah okay so now talk about um, the uh, the exposure that AAI has to the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council can we use that I mean I want to use that I will use that we will use that to uh, to interface with the embassies so that we might be able to get some embassy help. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? That might make sense. Um, that would In be more countries. that would be very helpful when we, when they're out after they're out. Uh, I, I think. think I think the embassies could could help getting people out. It happened in Egypt. But usually they don't like to interfere because it comes with a diplomatic cost. But if you could do that, if you could make an embassy decide to help one of us, that would be like all what we need. Like nothing more, you know, nothing more, I not see. money, not that would be totally enough. But to do that, I'm not sure how. That's why, that's why I was talking about lobbying. We need better lobbying for for people like us, you know. Yes. And, um, that's a that's a different form of activism, which I also want to interest David in, separate from because that's a longer term investment. A longer term investment is to get countries and 
human rights organizations and United Nations and all that to care more about atheists, right? And oh, I think yeah. that, that would be a longer term investment. And I think y your United Nations uh, connection, it would be very, very helpful on that one, right? right? So, but that would be a different form of activism and a longer term investment. Okay. Um, what about the Atheist Republic consulates? Is that something that we could use or not? Because we, in some countries, we have a whole bunch of atheists locally available in our Atheist Republic consulates. Would that be help? Can we use that to build safe hubs? I, I'm, I, I don't know if we can, because I, I, if we do build safe hubs, it needs to, it can't be, it needs to be very, we need to be very secretive about that, right? So we can't, it needs to be only a few people are aware about where these places are and who's involved in it. Because if more people know about it, the higher chances of it leaking and we might be putting people at risk. Uh, you know, we might actually be guiding them into a trap <laughs> rather than actually moving them to a safe hub, right? So yeah. I, I might, we might not use the consulates for this because maybe we want to have a very limited number of people aware about where these safe hubs are, but go on. Yeah, I mean, get, uh, I'll just talk about my experience in Cairo. Uh, after I went to the shows, uh, people were telling me like, yeah, now you will get arrested and it's better to uh, relocate and go somewhere else. And uh, some of my friends in Atheist Republic have actually offered me their houses and offered me to go and stay there in case something uh, something terrible happened or whatever. And uh, one case I know of where a person from uh, Atheist Republic Cairo have actually opened their house to someone, uh, endangered ex-Muslim, and uh, he stayed there for, for um, some period of time until he left Egypt. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so it happens, uh, not organized at all, uh, it's totally uh, volunteers. Organic. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it could be, some of people in there could be of help, like we're talking about building networks. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe you have a bunch of atheists in here, at least one of them or two might be able to provide a degree of help. So maybe the people that we didn't set up, the people within the consulates that organically just helped and it worked out, then that's already a vet, like I was thinking about a vetting process. But if somebody has successfully done that, that's the most vetting pro best vetting process. We can know that this person is not a government agent or something like that because they have already helped an atheist stay there for a while, right? So we could just right. go with people that have already done that and be like, hey, can we come up with a if you're interested in working with us on an ongoing basis, like if you have a couch or a bed, extra bedroom, would you be willing to offer this place? Because we also must be saving money, right? Because instead of paying people, these people to stay at a hotel, if we could, like, if they could just stay with a local atheist, then w the money that we are raising for them will stretch longer, and you know, we would be saving money that way. We would be able to help more money. Again, people, when I say save money, it's not that we don't care about people's lives. We care about, more about money than people's lives, right? It's just more, it's about the money that we have could help more people if we if we come up with ways that we could save money, okay? People think like, oh, wow, like Armin cares more about saving dollars than people's lives. No, okay? We're going to have limited resources. It needs to stretch, like, we, need to, it, we need to be able to share, use it on more people. I think you just want money more than saving lives. I mean, I that's all <laughs> yeah, that's why. I, okay, never mind. I'm not gonna. So, go. so tell me about. So tell me, uh, Mohammed, about leaving Egypt illegally. Um, if you leave Egypt illegally, I mean, I know you did not do that, but if let's let's say you did not get your visa, um, you did not get, uh, and and you are going to be arrested when you go to the airport. You're going to be hassled when you go to the airport. You have to cross the border illegally. Um, and let's, um, well, what is involved with crossing an international border illegally? What's involved with leaving <laughs> Egypt? Not, yeah, like basically, uh, as far as I understand, it was my plan B actually to go through the Mediterranean. But, um, yeah, basically you are putting your life at great risk because some people die, so you might simply die in the process. 
that is that is very uh, reasonable thing to to expect. And uh, you just uh, manage to find a smuggler, a smuggler, human smuggler somehow, and you pay them a sum of money, and then you Not would be, yeah. And then you would be uh, hoping that you don't die in the process or he doesn't sell you for somebody to take your organs or like any crazy stuff happens to you. And a lot of, a lot of people drown. A lot of yeah, people drown. a lot of people drown in the sea, unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the smuggler... Wait a minute, why would, you, why would you drown if you pay a smuggler to take you across the water? They, they spend a lot... Uh, they, they try to cut costs on their boats... Uh, and they usually overcrowd, like they go way beyond capacity on these boats, way beyond capacity because they're trying to make the most money and spend the least amount. So safety wise, these boats are the most dangerous way of uh, getting across the sea. And then the fake passports and the uh, fake papers, that also could be uh, an option. Uh, but the risk that uh, you might be you might get arrested in the process, and then you would be in in worse situations than that you started with. So now it's it's a fraud or a, or a forgery, and plus plus already the the sentence you have for for blasphemy or whatever. Of course, in Iran, for instance, that wouldn't make it worse because you would be uh, g- gonna be executed. In Saudi, also executed. Um, in Egypt, it would be uh, worse because, like, you might get fa- up to five years in prison. So um, yeah, so so in Egypt, the crimes for trying to escape illegally is worse than the blasphemy. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure, but definitely it's gonna make your situation worse. Worse, but so, in Iran and Saudi Arabia, your situation is already maximized to the t- to the you know. Yeah, so there's it's no it's way to get worse. Yeah, <laughs> right. it's not gonna make it worse, but you're gonna get. Cool. That that yeah. is the worst thing ever, you know. Right. Um. So 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 we need to, we need to talk to like for example, you didn't go through the illegal process of getting out, but like Rana did. Rana had the uh, illegal way, and then the second way was the illegal way. So we could talk to Rana about that as well. We we, we should have her on. Um. But so what would be the step by step process of? Getting there, I think what we need to do. So, based on David, you basically cut it into three pieces, and I think that's let's just focus on that funding, guidance, and connections. We need to figure out, we need to bring on now experts for each one of these separately, right? So, uh, and talk to different people regarding so, what is the best way to do the fundraising, right? Um, maybe is it GoFundMe, is it other places, right? So, each one of the each time. What's the fundraising, right? Uh, what's the process behind that? Um, the second one, the guidance, right? We could co- we could start a Google Doc, right, and start working with a team of people on how what is what is the best guide that we can come up with, right? That is easy. That's probably the easiest part to come up with a guide and get as many people to look at it and scrutinize it and come up with comments until it's the best thing we have. Uh, then the third one is connections. For, for building a network, I think we need to have more meetings like this um, and keep talking and basically come up with a network of people for each country and exactly what each one of these people are responsible for in each one of these countries, right? Mm-hmm. So I think for having different meetings about each one of these separately would be a most the most efficient way of moving forward. What do you guys that think? That sounds right. That sounds reasonable. Perfect. Okay. I, 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 it sounds reasonable. I think uh, I, I think we've got. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm beginning to grasp the. Um, I, I'm beginning to grasp the method here. Uh, I'm still. Um, I'm not understanding why. I'm not understanding why. If it's about money. Why aren't more people escaping? Is it if I mean it, it, I mean I, I'm under the impression. Well, I know we we've got like 50 cases at uh, Atheist Alliance International that we're working on right now, and it just seems to me that I'm missing something. That yeah. that it. <laughs> It's not just about money, it's connections too, because, I mean, it's not easy to find those, uh, for me at least, 
it was very hard to find that human smuggler or to find someone to fake a passport or this is not an easy step like I've lived my whole life in Egypt very low obeying citizens the only time I broke the law was on TV when I was blasphemous so I, I didn't get to know in my life any like I've never even smoked hash or something because that's illegal in my country so uh, that's Seattle the, <laughs> I've never, I don't smoke and I've never even, yeah, because like I, I obey the law, I, my friends are all like me and it's just, so sometimes the connections is very important because you don't mm. know any other way, you don't really know how to go through this ways, you know. So you're saying, Muhammad, based on your experience, other than the funding, the the connection, the third option, that, it, that is a a good thing to focus on to provide people those connections that is a key thing yeah, to focus it's on it's very important okay good 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 all right all right and david if if there is something like you i think like you're looking at this and you're thinking like we could do more this is not enough but i'm if we figure out what is number 4 or what number 5 that we could add to this we could just add, once we figure it out we could just add to it right you know what I mean? Like once we figure out what is that number four thing that we could do in addition to the funding and guidance and connection that is going to make a major difference, we're just going to we're just going to have a well. Here's number four, right? Uh, based on what we know right now, these are the three areas that we could help. But we will learn more and we could adjust accordingly as we keep working on this. Absolutely, and, and as far as I'm, I mean, from what I'm hearing, the establishment of an actual uh, underground railroad is possible, but we have to do it on an individual country ba- country by country basis. Right. Um, but I believe from what from this conversation that establishing a network establishes the railroad, establishing the network inside the country, and establishing the funding from outside the country creates the mechanism for a lot of people to leave. And that's where we're going to get into your economies of scale, Armin, where $50,000 gets out 50 people instead of five people. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's all about the organization. It's all about the local network, finding the guy with the fake passports, finding the smuggler, getting everybody connected, finding the safe houses, all of it. We can't right. hold back. We have to have all of the options available, and right. that means we're going to have to have some sort of a, some sort of a centralized, um, well, maybe even a decentralized, but centralized sources mm. uh, inside each country, uh, where we can, um, where we can send people who need our help to, and then those people would help people based on their local needs, based on the specific needs whether you could leave legally or illegally whether you could cross the border uh on foot or on boat uh whether you need a smuggler or a face passport or you just need a visa Mm. um once we make those connections then we push in the money and we use the vetting process from the local networks to do the vetting right um if we do this correctly we could make a machine Exactly. And we also have to find out the best way to send to get the money into their hand. Because one thing I did, I use Western Union to keep I kept like I got the money from GoFundMe and sent the money to run a, through Western Union and Western Union took a major cut from the whole thing, right? So uh, and if yeah, we could Western Union might not even work. Sometimes it will not work. It will tell you there is no, you're not related to this person and you cannot send the money. So wow. to transfer the money, that's sometimes not easy. So, so wow. th- again, so this is when the number one and number three become connected because when we get the funding, if we have local connections, right, we could just send our people on the ground the money and they could just give the person the money when they see them yeah, as well, you, right? Yeah. You might so, establish a way because it's not always easy to send the money because... Like, for instance, in Egypt, we have laws against foreign currencies, uh, not laws, but regulations, so that if uh, Troy sent me the money in maybe uh, Australian dollars, then uh, I would have been investigated, and they would have told me, oh, why is this money, and where, and who are you, 
And right. then that's over. That would be my story. And, and guys, so. this is why it's going to be very, very, very important to rely on our lo local networks, not just to help the people on the ground, but also to be before we even start picking up a case for us to vet the people that we're helping. Like imagine if we end up sending money to somebody that ends up being a local terrorist or something that we, the actively fund the terrorism in Turkey or something, right? This is, <laughs> so we need to have come up with a very, very, very efficient. And That's why you were talking about activists. So right. if you are helping activists, then right. first there are, not so many of us because right. people don't want to lose everything so right. we're not not a lot and uh yeah and you will know their cases because they're not there will be a little of a ripple happening around them yes again, wouldn't again the, yeah go on wouldn't the networks themselves be filled with atheists i mean these local people that we're going to be talking to um They're going to be atheists in those countries too. Not necessarily. Going to be... Not necessarily. There might be. There might be Muslim human rights lawyer, a Muslim human rights lawyer, for example. Mm -hmm. That as you know, they they don't they don't care that the person is an atheist. They're just a human rights lawyer and they want to help. Okay. In Egypt, yeah. for instance, Christian people are very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are believing in uh, in church and this nonsense, they they are very supportive of us. And uh, because they are also, in a way, getting persecuted by the Muslim majority, mm. so uh, not necessarily to be to be uh, atheist. Uh, I, on a personal level, I wouldn't trust a Muslim person as much in Egypt. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm being very truthful. It might not be so POC, but that's coming out of experience. Uh, I'm not saying that this is correct. Uh, I'm just saying that. Um, It's safer, I guess. Right. Unless somebody has established track record of fighting for human rights and leaving the religious biases aside. Right. And I, don't, I don't know much people who are like this. And if somebody is like this, you will might find them having their own version of Islam, not, not like the mainstream Islam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we know. That's that's a whole other discussion. But we, oh, okay. yeah, but I'm familiar. But I'm, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Anyways, this has been an hour right now. I think we uh, we, um, we this was very efficient. I think and we we now have a direction, uh, you know, on, on moving to. And I think um, David, uh, you know, Muhammad, would you be able to continue working with us and reviewing the processes that we come up with? I could really help with Egypt. I could help with with all of your ideas and everything. Yeah, yeah. Just thank just you. Keep in contact and and try to do our best. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank, thank, so thank you so much. Thank Mohammed. you for having me. Thank you for uh, trying to help and trying to uh, forward the cause and making the world a better place. I truly appreciate you guys. Ah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, as we should you as talk, well. We should talk to Troy as well. I think if he's available, by the way. What do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, Troy would be um, a role model of a Western citizen who is uh, trying to help us and making the... Because he tried so many different work. things, so he could tell us a lot about what works and what... From a Western person perspective, people, uh, someone who believes in enlightenment and doing their best to make the world a better place, yeah. Atheists are under attack in many places. If they were Christians, their voices would be heard. If they were Jews, their voices would be heard. If they were Muslims, their voices would be heard. But they are atheists, and not many seem to be listening. Let's make it difficult for them to ignore us. We have built a global community, and now we are tearing down geographic, cultural, and language barriers so we can find each other and support each other. In the last decade, we have built the largest atheist community in the world. Now we're doing the same in other languages. With your help, we have started Atheist Republic in Persian and Arabic. انضميت مؤخرا لأسرة Atheist Republic وحيصير عندي بودكاست باللغة العربية. As we grow, we can dedicate more time, staff, and resources to start doing the same in Spanish, Portuguese, Malay, Bengali, Urdu, 
Hindi and other languages. We are providing community, support, informative content, and amplifying the voices of those who need protection, especially in countries where people feel isolated simply for their lack of belief. We want to be there for them, and we are only getting started. Help us get there. Check in the description for ways you can support our projects.